welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Uh, we are here on February 21st on Tuesday afternoon um, to take up um, two pieces of uh, business. The first of which um, is going back to the recommendations of the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission. Uh, there were a couple of changes we had asked uh, Ledge Council to make. So Tim is here to kind of reorient us to that language and uh, talk about the latest draft. So Tim, welcome. Thank you very much, Chair McCarthy. Good afternoon, everybody. For the record, my name is Tim Devlin, Legislative Council. Uh, before you, you have draft 2.1 of the committee bill, uh, which we're referring to as 23-0907, having to do with miscellaneous um, uh, law enforcement uh, training for the recommendations of the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission. This bill, um, just quickly uh, running through each section to provide presentation as requested, uh, section one, um, will require law enforcement agencies and constitute to exercise law enforcement authority to adopt the 2010 domestic violence involving law enforcement model policy and any future updates of that policy. Section two is session law will, will require the Vermont Law Enforcement Advisory Board to update the domestic violence involving law enforcement model policy by January 1st, 2024. And I'd just like to note a change in the previous version that had been 2025, it will now be 2024, to reflect uh, VF, uh, FRC recommendations. See, so section three um, moves into officer misconduct and transparency of information. Section three, um, in, <clears throat> sorry, amends uh, Title 20 VSA, section 2404, and that's uh, definitions for law enforcement officer certification and Vermont Criminal Justice Council structure. To one, include the, the issuance of a relief from abuse order, sorry, a relief from abuse order is a category A conduct. And to include the violation of the domestic um, violence policy, model policy, as category B conduct. And again, for reference, Category A conduct is namely felonies and certain misdemeanors. Category B conduct is various types of gross professional misconduct. Here I'd also like to pause and point out a change in the last um, version, and which is uh, a terminology. Um, the new draft now reflects it, uh, the language as a final relief from abuse order versus a relief from abuse order, just for clarification, clarification specification of what the law actually uh, describes. Section four uh, will require the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to collect and annually, re annually report aggregate data regarding domestic and sexual violence in complaints of category A and B conduct resulting in filings or charges or stipulations or the taking of disciplinary action. I'll pause that. Any questions from the committee about the words on the page, those couple of updates? Before we get into testimony, yes, Representative Chase. Relief from abuse order versus final relief from abuse order. Uh, either way, there uh, it, it does one last longer than the other. Is there like a relief from abuse order is this temporary or? Um, that is an excellent question. I'm not sure if there is a. Um, you know, I have to get back to you about that. I'm not too particularly uh, uh, familiar with. Sarah Robinson from the network is going to be our our couple witnesses deep here, and she she raised her hand and said she'd be willing to speak to that, Representative Chase. So, thank you. Great question. Uh, any other questions about the words on the page? Great. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your work on this. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Chief Sean Burke up. Uh, he's here in his role as the LEAB. Uh, committee chair, and so I appreciate you being with us today. Pleasure. I think it's uh, been since 2019 since I've been here in person. So it's <laughs> fantastic. And so, uh, thank you. Just for the record, my name is Sean Burke. I have the privilege of being the police chief in the city of South Burlington. I also am chair of the current law enforcement advisory board, or it's known in acronym as the LEAB. I also have a bifurcated um, view on this work as I also serve as the law enforcement appointee to the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission. So thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony 
Um, this proposed bill related to domestic violence involving law enforcement employees. The Vermont law enforcement community has a strong appetite for a mandatory domestic violence policy of this nature. Currently, many of our agencies have some of the key tenants of the 2010 domestic violence uh, employee policy in place. Given the passage of time and other relevant legislative changes, the 2010 model policy is due for an update. The law enforcement advisory board would welcome the opportunity to hear from stakeholders who could best inform a revision of the policies with specific focus on addressing survivor needs, leveraging best practice and awareness prevention and investigation, identifying existing support mechanisms for employees, ident identifying new means of supporting employees, developing processes and practices which protect affected employees and privacy interests, and providing clear policy guidance related to firearm surrender for employees who are defendants in protection orders. The model policy in its current form is not ready for publication. The Law Enforcement Advisory Board would appreciate the opportunity to revise the model policy in 2023 with a legislative mandate for adoption in 2024. The law enforcement community also believes in accountability and professional regulation. Designating the domestic violence involving law enforcement employee policy as a state required policy would in turn create this accountability. Violations would become category B conduct as defined in Title 20, Section 2401. By virtue of this designation, there would be no need <clears throat> to expand the language of category B violations to include on and off duty conduct as this would be inherent via the model policy. Category B violations require agencies to conduct a valid internal investigation. Violations of the state required domestic violence policy would necessitate a report to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council as defined in Title 20. This process would afford the due process employers and employees need and leverage leverages potential sanction by the Vermont Criminal Justice Council as it pertains to state certification. The draft bill includes language that would expand Category A conduct to include the issuance of a final review, relief from abuse order. Category A conduct was specifically created to address criminal behavior. The intent of this language could be better served by explicitly calling out any sustained violation of the domestic violence involving law enforcement policy as reportable and actionable to the council under category B. In closing, there is strong support across law enforcement for this draft bill. To ensure that this draft bill is effective and consistently interpreted, consideration should be given to the policy development work in reliance on the accountability measures currently in statute. Criminal violations are more unique from both <clears throat> an intent and evidentiary standard. Category A conduct does not need to be expanded in order to, to achieve the intent of this bill. Those are my prepared remarks. I'm fairly conversant in this topic. Um, you know, I've been doing this job for just over 29 years now. So I would honor any questions that you had of me. So, so Chief, I just wanna make sure that I understand um, exactly what you're saying. So on the, on the model policy, um, you support the process that's laid out in the bill and the adoption of that mod model policy for 2024. I do, however, if you look at the 2010 version that was um, produced by the LEAB, it's really a draft model policy. And because it references other policies that uh, Department of Public Safety had in place at the time. Many of those, as I understand it, are not mandated policies and also makes references that just aren't contemporary. I think it's very important for a policy of this magnitude that we take it up, LEAB, uh, that the LEAB takes it up this year and we get an, a really operational model policy for publication immediately in January. So um, we wouldn't necessarily have to change the references to the 2010 policy because this language does envision any updates that are adopted by the LEAB. So um, is it your intention to kind of get, up, get on the record that the LEAB should this year adopt the next iteration of the policy before the, the, Janu the January 1st implementation that's envisioned in the draft language? 
I think we're saying the same thing. So um, what I'm suggesting is that it would be really flawed if we mandate, if we attempted to mandate the 2010 policy in its current form, like say tomorrow. I think the LEAB is gonna need um, the months that we have remaining in 2023 to um, hear from the stakeholders, develop the policy so it is operational, and uh, you know we we pledge to do so, and you will legislatively mandate us to have it done by January twenty four. Great. Uh, so we we have envisioned in the top of section two of this bill that it will be on or before January first, twenty twenty four. So hopefully that's enough time if we move this bill forward to make that happen. Um, The other question that I had was in regard to um, your testimony about making a final relief from abuse order a category A misconduct. So am I understanding correctly that you do not support that aspect of the bill? So this is the perspective um, that we bring. Sometimes, and Sarah will, will testify to this, sometimes there are odd stipulations in these family court orders, uh, one of which could be a survivor could stipulate that their partner remain employed and have the ability to carry a firearm. Uh, depending on you know the federal nuances of that, that could be largely problematic labeling this simple issuance of the final relief from abuse order as category A. What I think we would find though, with a policy in place, that the underlying conduct leading up to the issuance of that final relief from abuse order would be actionable. And I believe from my perspective of administering internal affairs and my perspective on how the Criminal Justice Council is kind of tackling these cases, that if we focus on the conduct, keep the conduct as conduct B, as category B, and make any any violation reportable and actionable as the as the council sees fit, would probably be the most effective way to get at the intent of this draft bill. So, a conversation that I've had outside of this room that is going to come up later on today, as we hear testimony from the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, has to do with the fact that right now, category B is. Basically, it's not misconduct until it or it doesn't drive the whole uh, process of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to review, as my understanding, until it sort of happened twice, right? And so we've discussed outside of this room the idea that perhaps we should give more discretion to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to treat specifically egregious Category B misconduct as if it were category A. And is that the kind of thing that you're talking about doing here instead of what we have in the bill where it says category A conduct means the issuance of the final relief from abuse order? I do think that's a sensible evolution. And when I think about all of the police reform energy afoot, I really want to see us invest in this framework that was stood up in 2018 and make it effective. Lots to think about there, Chief Burke. Uh, other questions, I've dominated this, <laughs> sorry about that. Other questions for the Chief? All right, you've given the committee a lot to think about with your testimony, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite Sarah Robinson from the Vermont Network to join us. Afternoon. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson. I'm the deputy director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and it is a pleasure to be back with this committee discussing this bill. Thank you so much for taking up the recommendations of the Fatality Review Commission. Um, we're very heartened that uh, this committee has taken an interest in these recommendations and look forward to the continued conversations about the most effective way to make those recommendations a reality. Um, so just Big picture broadly um, to reground ourselves and kind of the, the recommendations themselves. As uh, I testified previously to this committee, the Fatality Review Commission, we conduct in depth reviews of specific domestic violence homicides. And as part of that review process, um, we determine kind of where there are gaps in our response system, where we could be doing better, um, and where there are opportunities for either institutional policy or statute 
to evolve, to better address ideally violence that's happening in a certain context prior to it becoming lethal. Um, and as part of one of the reviews that we conducted in the the past several years, um, these issues that have kind of brought forth this recommendation um, came to light. And so I, I just love to address each one of them um, and also get back to Representative Chase's question about relief from abuse orders just broadly. Um, the first thing I'll say is that we're really glad that um, the LEAB is going to take a look at the model domestic violence policy completely um, in alignment with Chief Burke's testimony that the 2010 policy is not complete. It needs to be updated and we um, very much are in favor of the leave taking that up in the next year and getting it to a place where by the deadlines in the proposed bill, um, those could be adopted by agencies across the state. Um, there have been many places where model law enforcement policies have been really useful. Um, sometimes they're promulgated by the state police. Um, others have come out of the LEAB, and we think it's a really, it, it's a good strategy for ensuring that there's consistency across the state. Um, and we also think that it's helpful to have aggregate, more transparency and aggregate information about uh, the extent to which law enforcement officers do have conduct violations related to domestic violence. I um, think that element of the bill is really important. And finally, I'll kind of get to this category A, category B question. Um, so a relief from abuse order, I realize that's not something that this committee is probably uh, discusses all that much, um, but in my line of work, it's something I'm really familiar with. So uh, you would find that in Title 15, 11, 03, and 04. And essentially what a relief from abuse order is, is it's a civil order of the court. So it is not related to someone reporting to law enforcement that they have experienced domestic violence. So it is when an individual goes to the court um, and they have to submit a petition and an affidavit with the court. They can do that at any time of the day um, or night. And then a judge reviews that petition and affidavit. And if they, based on the facts that they have available to them, to them determine that abuse has occurred and there is a risk of future abuse, they will issue what's called a temporary relief from abuse order. And a temporary order, again, it's a civil order. It exists for usually, um, well, by statute, uh, there needs to be a final hearing within 14 days. That temporary order is issued ex parte. That means that the person who is subject to the order um, is not part of that proceeding when the court or issues that temporary order. So within 14 days, there's a hearing um, at which the defendant is noticed to appear. Both parties are noticed to appear and the court will then take additional testimony about um, the extent of that abuse. If after that hearing where the defendant has had an opportunity to appear, the court still finds that abuse has occurred and there is a um, substantial risk for future abuse, they will issue a final relief from abuse order. Those orders are time limited. They're not forever. Um, most commonly, they might last one year or so. And as a result of a final relief from abuse order, um, there are various court conditions that the court can impose. Um, and those most often have to do with um, conduct, contact and conduct. So um, stay away conditions, limitations on contact, but they can also include things like um, conditions related to shared um, children that the parties may have custody of. Um, and they can, they almost always or always actually final relief from abuse orders also include an order that an individual um, not possess or be transferred a firearm. Um, and that is really, uh, that has been federal law for a very long time. Um, and that is just kind of part of the standard court order that um, is ordered at, at a final relief from abuse order. So then that order may be in um, place for say up, up to a year. And then if the petitioner, the victim in this case would like to continue the order at the ex 
prior to the expiration of that order, they would need to reapply to the court. So that's kind of what a um, relief from abuse order is. I will say it sits in this liminal, but very important place. It's not criminal conduct, right? It is not something that has been investigated by law enforcement, nor is it just a po policy violation of an employer. So it is a civil order that um, a judge has determined that abuse has occurred. There has been factual information that has been entered into the record um, through a petition and affidavit, and both sides have had the opportunity to present evidence to the court. Um, so our, we certainly are supportive of the recommendation that's coming from the Fatality Review Commission um, to include this in category A conduct. What I will say is that the, import, the important piece to us is the effect. And so um, I was just hearing from Chief Burke that there may be some additional opportunity to consider whether it is some kind of elevated category B conduct. Um, and the important thing, things to us, kind of the prerequisites is that relief from abuse orders, um, we need to ensure that conduct that happens off duty is uh, able to be kind of brought in as a uh, conduct violation um, and that it ha that there is some kind of reporting process as well. Um, and so for us, you know, really the, the impact is kind of what's the effect going to be. Um, and so whether it's category A or some kind of elevated category B, I'm sure we're happy to have that conversation. But um, the Fatality Review Commission did believe that it uh, was most was best aligned with category A at this point in terms of where the statute is is written currently. Happy to answer any questions. Yes. Okay. Um, so the word change that we're talking about here, adding final relief from abuse order on um, page three, line twenty, um, means that it would just be the the. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot okay. what you described it. The, the first one is the ex parte. Yeah, so it would uh, not be an ex parte the order. Second one. Correct. Um, and if we didn't have that word in there, it might include the Both. first one. Okay. Yeah, it could include a temporary or a final. Okay. Um, the temporaries are the two weeks that happen without the defendant being present when the judge makes that decision. The final is after the defendant has had the opportunity to appear. Um, so the final would only be issued after a hearing. Thank you. Yeah. One, uh, the only other thing I will note is that in currently, um, you'll note like category A conduct currently includes criminal violations. Category B conduct includes violations of policy. Again, we think that relief from abuse orders exist within a liminal space between the two. Um, and so for us, the most important thing is what would be the effect of putting it in one category or the other. Sarah, would you say that the most important thing, another way of saying that would be the most important thing to the Vermont network is to try to make it so that the Criminal Justice Council can act on the initial <coughs> substance of what's in the final uh, relief from abuse order, that it's the, the thing I struggle with is I don't think the Criminal Justice Council can take very immediate action if we, for instance, changed it from category A to category B. Correct. Yes. So I, we, would have to, we would have to change the discretion that the Criminal Justice Council has about an elevated level of category B misconduct if we were going to put, put this down in category B in order to have the same, the desired effect of being able to act immediately on a final relief from abuse order. Yes, and I, I defer to Chair Sorrell to speak about kind of the council's process on how category A and category B violations come to that body. But essentially, you know, we want to make sure that when there's a final relief from abuse order, that that is actionable um, as quickly as possible by by the council. Mr. Chair, Sarah, I, I thought I heard the chief say that in some instances, there could be in the order um, the ability for uh, an officer to continue to work, which would require 
use of a firearm. Can you explain that piece of it a little bit? Sure. So, um, and that brings up, Representative Higley, it brings up a really um, important point is that when domestic violence involves a law enforcement officer, there are always barriers to victims and survivors uh, reporting the violence that they experience, whether that's to the court or to law enforcement. Um, but when the violence involves a law enforcement officer, those barriers are enhanced, right? And so there's significant lack of trust that many victims and survivors have in calling law enforcement to report essentially one of their own as someone who has been abusive. And that's why the relief from abuse order process is so important because it doesn't require law enforcement involvement. So a survivor can go to the court and receive some element of protection without needing to navigate the law enforcement system necessarily. Um, it is possible that uh, the conditions of relief from abuse orders, final relief from abuse orders are tailored to the circumstances. They're tailored to what the, um, plaintiff, so the victim is asking for in terms of relief and safety. So sometimes um, the plaintiff will ask for very specific things or as a result of the hearing, there'll be information that is presented and the judge will essentially tailor the conditions. There are some standard conditions, but judges aim to make these orders tailored to the circumstances that exist. Um, all final relief from abuse orders do include conditions about surrendering firearms. However, um, there are certainly condition, there are certainly orders in which someone is subject to, to an order, but is able to work on, I don't know, um, Chief Burke would be able to tell me what the terminology is. I'm just gonna say desk duty, um, but kind of administrative duty or duty that doesn't involve possessing a firearm and, and keep their maintain their employment during the duration of the order. Um, and you can imagine that for a survivor who is depending on the income of kind of maybe a co-parent of their children, that that person being able to maintain employment for a certain period of time um, could be something that would be important to them. Great, thanks for explaining that. Yep. Questions for Sarah? Just a logistical for both the last witness and you. Is your testimony available in a written form so we could put it on our website? I would be happy to submit something to the committee. Yes, sir, it is. Yep. Thank you. Visual learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I apologize. I am double booked upstairs, so I'm going to head up there, but I'll come back down if I need to. Right. Thanks for being with us, Sarah. Um, I would like to invite, um, so I have Director Simons um, testifying next. Uh, Chair Sorrell, are you, would you like to come up sort of with her and testify in tandem or should I, should I just go to Director Simons? I want to... Uh, well, I take my orders from Director Simons. I'm okay. happy to go up and uh, be, yeah. be, in, be in the chair and either kick off or... Whatever. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. And it's okay with the committee. Um, we'll have Chair Sorrell begin. All right. I, I wanted to leave it uh, to your your team's discretion. I wouldn't want to put one of you before the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will gladly defer to Heather Simons and then her deputy, your deputy director of the. Uh, Academy, uh, Christopher Burkell, former police chief in Brandon, is also on and uh, is intimately involved with our procedures on relating to certification of law enforcement officers. Uh, for the record, Bill Sorrell, uh, chair of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, and just coincidentally, uh, this morning we had a meeting of the council and uh, we were talking about some legislative matters in the meeting, but the first orders of business were two cases in which we permanently uh, revoked the certification of former Vermont law enforcement officers for, in their cases, convictions of domestic violence related uh, uh, cases. And, 
if we haven't already put out a press release announcing those actions, uh, it will go out this afternoon. And there's a link in the in the press release to the uh, negotiated or stipulated resolutions of these cases, and uh, including some graphic details about the conduct on the part of these former officers against uh, family members or loved ones. And uh, uh, you talk about egregious conduct. It's, it's spelled out there. And uh, they, neither one of them, former Winooski officer and the former Manchester officer, are, have been employed for some time in Vermont law enforcement, but their Vermont certification is permanently revoked and they are reported to a national registry of uh, that uh, keeps, keeps track of officers who have lost their certification for various forms of misconduct. Uh, we did, after approving both of those uh, cases unanimously, I might Add, uh, took up some legislative matters, including the proposal before you today uh, on triggering the authority of the Criminal Justice Council to take action relating to uh, law enforcement officer certification status if a final relief from abuse order is, is issued. And uh, I, again, there was no one on the council who thought that a relief of, from abuse order was a de minimis kind of thing that shouldn't potentially impact a, an officer's certification uh, status. Uh, on the, we didn't have a, a in-depth discussion on whether it should be a category A violation or a category B violation. Uh, the only ones who spoke to it thought that if the Domestic Violence Fatality Review uh, Commission wants, thinks it ought to be an A, then, you know, okay. But I did want to, on behalf of the council, did raise with the council this issue of Category B violations, which are typically violations of uh, departmental policies that don't necessarily result in a criminal uh, complaint and a decision by a prosecutor to uh, bring charges against the officer and for a court to find probable cause that the officer did, in fact, violate this particular provision. What triggers a Category A violation is a finding of probable cause that an officer ha has violated the, the criminal law. Category B, in a case that didn't result in a criminal violation or even a finding of probable cause, the, the conduct might well be in violation of a departmental or statewide policy. And we have in statute, this well predates the existence of the Criminal Justice Council, the fact that under statute it says if it's a category B violation, the council it gets reported to the council, the council determines whether it's a well-founded category B violation, but the council has no authority to impose any discipline or punishment for a well-founded category B violation. The legislature subsequently has put, I think it's three specific situations in the statute that say, instead of my language, first bite of the apple is, is we, you can't be punished. If, there's a, if the conduct that is the category B violation uh, is uh, using a chokehold by law enforcement, that could trigger our jurisdiction to take take action. Similarly, uh, there's a requirement to uh, 
intervene by another officer to not sit by and watch unlawful conduct, excessive force being used on an individual. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a third issue uh, that I'm just forgetting right now, but these are minimal subsections of B that allow the council to take action first time the case comes through. And as we get more and more active in this arena, uh, there are category B violations and there are category B violations. And some of them factually are egregious. And so we talked a little bit at the council today whether the legislature rather than going kind of piecemeal over time and saying, oh, that's a B, but that's a really serious B and it ought to be in a special category that allows the council to do something first time through, and you're always kind of catching up with prior conduct, is you created this criminal justice council, you doubled the size of the old criminal justice training council, you added various community uh, voices and the Human Rights Commission and others, and would it make sense for you statutorily to strike that inability of the council to take action on an officer's certification the first time through if the council deemed that the conduct was sufficiently egregious first time through that uh, uh, action should be taken? and. I started by talking about the two cases that we permanently revoke certification today. Had the victims in those two cases not gone to the police, and so no criminal charge was, was filed, uh, just take a look at that conduct and think about whether that's, that's okay for any person, let alone a law enforcement officer, but arguably, particularly a law enforcement officer. So uh, uh, I, as the chair of the council, after taking the temperature of the council today, there is certainly some, there was no adverse uh, uh, commentary on the part of council members. The thought is that you would trust the council in its discretion to look at the facts of individual cases and empower the council to take disciplinary action on certification status first time through on a category B, then you wouldn't have to going into the future be continuing to add particular conduct that would trigger category B discipline first time through. So we ask you to consider that. I don't know whether it's in the context of this bill or some other piece of legislation, but I think it's an issue that warrants your consideration. Uh, uh, again, uh, the council is very supportive of being able to take action when there's a final review, relief from abuse order issued we are concerned that there is, what about one that we don't hear about? And uh, so ask you to consider uh, one, making it mandatory that an officer who's the subject of a final relief from abuse order discloses to his or her employer that that has been issued, similarly mandating that a police chief or supervisor uh, personnel in a department that, that is apprised that someone under his or her authority is the subject of a final relief from abuse order, that the employer should disclose to the council that fact, and then sort of the, there's no perfect mousetrap, but please consider mandating, there aren't a lot of these cases, please consider mandating that the court that issues a final relief from abuse order communicates that fact 
uh, when it's a law enforcement officer who's the subject of the RFA, uh, that the the court uh, uh, report that matter to the council. That makes sense to me. I have uh, questions from Representative Hooper and then Representative Higley. Um, when a relief, temporary relief for abuse order is filed, that's an affidavit. Is that evidence? that would authorize a state's attorney or are they barred from filing a charge based upon that? Uh, well, it, it, you would, it, they're, they're not statutorily barred, but uh, you would want the victim, unless you had external evidence of this conduct, you know, it was in front of the neighbors or something. Uh, you would want a cooperating victim to support any allegations. And uh, so it, it would not be likely, I was the state's attorney in Chittenden County two different times, sandwiched around 10 or 11 years in private practice. And then obviously it was the attorney general for almost 20 years. Uh, you, you wouldn't typically move forward in a case of this sort without a cooperating victim. And so the, uh, I, I, I think if uh, uh, my predecessor witness from the uh, network uh, was, was back, uh, I, there are an awful lot of victims who take the effort to get a relief from abuse order issued who would not want to participate in a jury trial and such against the, the person who has victimized typically her, but sometimes him. Did I answer your question, Bob? Or? Well, it just strikes me as weird if, it, if it's an egregious sort of level of abuse that uh, the court having ruled on it, uh, it would then not further be constituted. Well, there's a different standard uh, for the issuance of a relief from abuse order than a criminal conviction. Uh, you get proof beyond a reasonable doubt as opposed to some other standard, something like preponderance of the evidence or whatever, where you can err on the side of trying to be protected by issuing an order without finding beyond a reasonable doubt that the, the subject of the order did in fact, did in fact or does in fact represent that kind of a threat and need be ordered to either be out of the house, surrender his or her firearms, no contact, no text messages. You know, those orders can be very, very, very broad. It's not typically issued that a, a relief from abuse order is issued when the parties to it or the complainant and the subject of it are still together. Thank you. If the council is given that discretion to take disciplinary action after a first time through, what is what is the uh, officer's defense and, and is there ability to appeal? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, it's a matter that's handled by our professional regulations subcommittee of five members, a majority of the five non-law enforcement. And they really get into the weeds of the cases and look at the investigation that supports the, the allegations. They can ask for the department in question to do a further investigation. There's authority to conduct our own investigation if we wish, but then that group makes a determination that this is well-founded and that uh, some sort of action relating to certification is appropriate. And they so disclose to the, uh, the, the law enforcement officer or the yeah, in the law enforcement officer, who has every right to be represented by counsel. And then 
uh, there is the opportunity by the officer, if he or she is dissatisfied with what the professional regulation subcommittee has done, to appeal to the full council and for potentially a contested hearing, like a, like a trial before the, the, the council. In the two cases we had today, there was a stipulated a, a agreement uh, where the former officers agreed to have their certification permanently revoked. But uh, we will certainly have contested hearings at, at some point in time. We haven't had one since the council uh, started uh, January 1 of 21, but we will. And uh, there'll be a regular, like a, like a mini trial. And then ultimately there is the possibility of appealing to court by someone allegedly aggrieved. But uh, we, we will make sure that, I mean, just for example, that we don't have due process flaws in our procedures. So the five members of our, of our, our professional regulation subcommittee are not allowed to participate in an appeal hearing before the full council because they know much more information than might be admissible before the council about the case. And it would be like letting a prosecutor or a hat that I wore be on the jury, you know, and so that so that we we have uh, issues because we take those five people out of the equation of sometimes of making sure we have a, a quorum for the hearings that we had uh, this morning. And we're internally, you were revising our operating rules to have a different quorum thing because taking five of the 24 out all of a sudden makes it a little challenging to get the requisite quorum that we need and want. Thank you. We, um, we, we've, I, I think, got the committee to a reasonably good sense of kind of the crux of the, the issue around the final relief from abuse order category A versus their now sort of category B plus. <laughs> and there, there are multiple, if I'm understanding your testimony, Chair Sorrell, now there are Three, I think three, and and if we went in this direction, there might even be a fourth. Yeah, and uh, it, it, but is it your recommendation? Am I understand you correctly. You would rather us say instead of enumerating each category B misconduct uh, as potential for action on the first offense, uh, be to just say allow the criminal justice council to exercise its jurisdiction or its uh, discretion in what you would consider egregious or rise to that needing to take action on the Yes, that's, that's the ask. And, uh, and if, if you think that's a bad idea and you decide to have the fourth uh, category of offense that would trigger first time through, I, I, that would be okay. That would take care of relief from abuse orders, but I'd be very surprised if a year or two or three from now you weren't adding a fifth and a sixth uh, subcategory say at all. You can't you can't have one bite of it, a free a freebie on that kind of conduct. So I, I if if you think it makes sense to trust the judgment of the council, which you know I think we have forty or fifty open files right now, uh, obviously a range of of conduct. Uh, and so, you know, the council's not about permanently revoking everybody who is the subject of a professional regulation uh, complaint. <clears throat> I didn't mean to monopolize without Heather Simons and, and or Chris Brickell. Uh, they'll fire me if they have the opportunity here. Yeah, Heather, I think. And Deputy Director Brickell, I would, I would invite both of you to, uh, if you have additional comments to make that would help us understand the 
And feel free to disagree with anything I said that I said wrong. Chris, did you have anything? Go ahead, Chris. Okay, very well. Uh, for the record, uh, Deputy Director Chris Burkell for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, for someone who often says he's not sure he has all the particulars at hand, Chair Sorrell just detailed very, very appropriately. So um, all of the factors that play into the subcommittee's review and also details that um, there are many things that you may look at in the near future where you see some sort of behavior that has not been listed in statute that you're now looking at and saying, well, maybe we need to address this as a category B uh, first offense where we can take action. I think it does make sense from a procedural standpoint for the council to be able to have that discretion to look at category B violations and say, is this something that the subcommittee should review and send to the council for potential action? Because as category B is written, and you'll notice in there, there's only seven policy violations in there, but the language says, it defines council policy and shall include. So it includes many other policies that the subcommittee has already reviewed, where, uh, for instance, the department has an ethics policy and they have somebody that goes to an internal affairs investigation and lies. Is that something that the council should take action on? Um, well, given the current construct, the council could not take any action on that. That would just be a first offense. So do you want somebody that has a background where they're comfortable in lying to their employer um, and someone who has the job of being an ethical person to be able to, to get away with something like that? Uh, that's certainly something for uh, this committee to to discuss and and contemplate and in addition to that having having that discretion if the council were given that discretion there are options for the officer to defend themselves or for the council to take limited sanctions on something that maybe doesn't rise to the level of permanent decertification but th when that comes to the council at that point the officer gets notified um, through a notice of hearing, when that hearing will be, can be represented by counsel. And in addition to that notice, the subcommittee can also work on a stipulated agreement with that officer. So sometimes the subcommittee could come to terms of an agreement with an officer that outlines perhaps some sort of other sanction, but retraining or other, other areas of, of responsibility that the officer should be paying attention to. So uh, I'll just end my my testimony there and answer it. Happy to answer any questions, but I do think that giving the council the option of looking at category B violations rather than uh, in the future having to look at continual policy violations might make more sense. Representative Higley has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, more of a statement, I guess, or um, should should this be before judiciary as well? This particular piece. I just have a concern about her abilities to understand the scope and maybe even who else should testify in regards to uh, the other the other side of the story, you know, the law enforcement officers. Just what they're thinking, allowing the, the council to have authority. So Here's what I found. <laughs> <laughs> what you found we're going to ask Siri if uh, she can tell us what to do here. Um, so so I, what, I, what I think would be appropriate for us, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking that we're going to dive into this uh, at least once again this week um, with opportunity for testimony before we move anything out. And I, I think that it didn't, it didn't come onto my radar until I heard Chief Burke lay it out um, that we may want to tweak the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission, we may want to consider doing that so that it's actually not automatic, right? And so um, we've heard that one voice of law enforcement. I think it would be appropriate for us to ask um, some other representatives from law enforcement. I think it's what you're right. you're asking for to come in and weigh in on um, the specific recommendation about um, final relief from abuse orders, and then the broader 
connected and ask that we have these category B misconducts um, that we give discretion to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to, to you know, have proceedings on the first time. We don't sort of give two bites of the apple if, if you know, they feel there's an obvious egregious misconduct, even though it's uh, a violation of a policy as opposed to a crime. The, dis the distinction, Chair Sorrell or, or, or maybe Deputy Director Brickell or Director Simons, the distinction between category A right now is category A, there's like an investigatory, you know, it's criminal or, you know, or it's misdemeanor. There's, there's already some investigatory threshold there. Whereas with category B, those are policy, misconduct, violations, behavior that doesn't rise to the level of criminality, but is clearly uh, misconduct. Am I understanding this? this uh, or it, 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 it could re uh, rise to the level of criminality, but if it's not charged, it's not complained about to the police or whatever, uh, that it wouldn't necessarily result in a criminal charge. Uh, you know, for example, the final relief from abuse order, which uh, any number of, of folks who have applied for those are not looking to have the matter litigated in criminal court. <clears throat> and I will say uh, that, you know, on the council, the, the, the sheriffs and the chiefs association and the troopers association, uh, uh, League of Cities and Towns, they're all represented and we're in a position today to, 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 uh, to speak up. And I invite us that anybody wants to speak against this idea, please feel free to do that. But I certainly would encourage you to hear from the voices, including law enforcement, that you would want to hear from on this issue. Um, before we move to Captain Burnham's testimony, uh, I just wanted to offer Director Simons a chance if you had anything else you wanted to add. Thank you. For the record, Heather Simons, Executive Director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. I will just add uh, context for the discussion and um, remind folks that we're not just talking about accountability and law enforcement, but we're talking about the council's, uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council's role and um, the police academy being the first stop in the education and training and readiness for law enforcement. And domestic violence is not, domestic and sexual violence is not particular or specific to law enforcement, but really a systemic and societal problem. And that um, we know that when we uh, get in front of these things, we can uh, prevent them. And uh, the goal here is to prevent them and to recognize that there it, we have a strained workforce everywhere and that uh, we're not talking about a profession that is plagued with this issue. What we're talking about is a process for recognizing behavior for what it is and for investigating it properly. This also uh, allows for another message and that is that um, law enforcement officers who are victims hear that they also can come forward. This is not, uh, there's the um, presumption often that when we say uh, relief from abuse order that we're talking about men and, and the assumption is that the victim is female and that's not always the case. And in addition to it being underreported, it's also vastly underreported by men and certainly by law enforcement. And I, I bring that up for, uh, you know, for context in terms of the point of sorting this out is that people are safe and that when we say victims and we say survivors, we mean children and, and um, victims are humans and the damage is, as we all know, generational as well. And this is something that we can address at the Academy. And that is the point for us is that when uh, we um, we're pretty certain that there's no one untouched by this in some way, either in their own nuclear family, extended family, friends, et cetera, and recruits attending the academy um, 
are also touched by this. So we wanna begin the accountability process, understanding that we can't be accountable if we don't educate and we can't educate if we fully with meaningful training, unless um, we build in empathy. And this, this process is one piece of the bigger picture. And that's really all I wanted to add. And I appreciate your time. Thank you uh, for the Criminal Justice Council delegation. Um, I am, so just so that you know, my plan is to um, hear uh, Captain Burnham's testimony, take a brief break, and then we'd like to come back and talk about some of the, the other elements that you had asked if you feel like we have time uh, to, to do that today. So sure, great if you'll... Uh, Hang out. <laughs> I'll hang out. We'll, we'll, we'll be back to talk with you more on some of the, the other asks. Um, and I'd like to invite Captain Lance Burnham to come and give the department's feedback on um, this draft language. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, um, uh, good afternoon and thank you uh, committee here for allowing the state police to come and uh, provide testimony on this issue. For the record, my name is Lance Burnham. I am a captain with the Vermont State Police. I am also the chair of the Vermont State Police Domestic Violence Task Force. Uh, we are currently working very heavily uh, in the state police on multiple domestic violence issues, um, specifically regarding how our troopers in training our troopers are responding to these cases uh, to the highest level that we possibly can. Um, not to not to really get into the waters of that, but we are we are at the forefront um, and inviting our municipal and our sheriff's partners to make sure that we are responding to these cases with the most training, with the best ability of investigative tools that we have available to us. Um, my testimony luckily, thankfully, is going to be very short because if I could just say ditto to the chief, I would. Um, however, there are a couple things that I think I really need to point out. Um, uh, as the bill is written currently, um, there are certain issues that the Vermont State Police feels needs to be pointed out and changed. However, we fully support this initiative. Uh, we are behind this 100% as I think is every law enforcement agency in the state of Vermont. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is uh, the need between the separation of the RFA process and the internal investigation, as well as the criminal justice council proceedings. There needs to be a separation in that. Uh, you heard the chief say that we really want to focus on the conduct of the officer. That is of the utmost importance to us. Uh, there are, as you heard, Sarah and the chief and, and, and other tests testify about the relief from abuse orders. It's, it, it's a very convoluted system sometimes, sometimes. And as a police officer and as, quite frankly, a commander, I want to focus on my troopers' actions. And we hold them to the highest accountability. Uh, VSP uh, in most agencies in the state of Vermont has a long history of holding our our members amongst our ranks accountable for their actions, especially domestic assault cases. Um, I can think of two in my career of 20, 24 years um, where we have charged troopers with domestic assault. It is front headlines. Um, they are very thorough investigations. Um, and we've held them accountable and they, know they are no longer wearing our uniform. Um, and, they have, and they have gone through the process through the Criminal Justice Council as well. So the VSP perspective is we need to focus on the accountability and actions of the officers, not necessarily the RFA process in and of itself. Secondly, uh, I wanna echo what the chief mentioned with the, the LEAB report uh, policy of 2010. It is not a finished product. Um, it is a great policy. It is moving forward. Um, if you look at VSP's policy, it is almost word for word. Um, I can't say whether the LEAB took our policy and adapted it. Um, I, I don't know that. 
But it, we are also changing our policy almost annually because we look at these and we look at societal issues today and to make sure that our policy is of uh, the best that it can be. To roll out a mandate to all law enforcement on a policy that is not finished will cause a lot of concern to all law enforcement. It'll cause confusion. It will also cause a very slow and unnecessary rollout. Uh, we just ask and agree with the chief that we allow the LEAB the next year, this year, to finalize that product, have conversations with stakeholders, VSP, sheriffs, municipalities, the network, to make sure that when that policy is ready to be rolled out, that that's when it be rolled out, not just be set on an arbitrary date. Um, I fear, and as was sometimes when mandates come down, we have agencies that run from 350 officers to one, yet we're all held to the same standards. So those agencies that are um, smaller in nature, they don't have the resources, to put a statewide mandate out that that's not finished is gonna cause confusion to them and it'll it'll uh, it, it'll potentially even impact training as it as it rolls down in the future. So we just ask that that LEAB, as the chief said, let them finalize that product so we can roll it out in January of 2024. Um, so Captain Byrne, can I ask you the same question I asked Chief Burke, which is if we essentially say we're, we want to see a model policy implemented by January 1st, the 2010 is where is the draft, but whatever the, the LEAB's latest version is at that time, that's, that's what you have the authority, you know, that's what we're expecting. Uh, you know, does that satisfy your concern if we're giving the whole year before before we're mandating that that policy be adopted. As long as there's interaction between the, the, the uh, LEAB and the stakeholders in and of themselves, I have no doubt that they can finish that by January 1. I'm not on the LEAB, um, so I don't want to speak for them. But if Chief Burke says he can get it done, he can get it done. Thank you. I just think the important aspect is the collaboration between the important stakeholders. Would that mean that if a new version isn't done by then, then the 2010 version goes into effect by default? I would hope not, because there are many things in 2010 that are referencing policy that we have that are no longer valid. Um, and we don't want our, our policy. Our policy should not be a statewide mandate. Our policy is an internal policy. It works for the state police. It does not mean that it's going to work for Fairly Police Department or Rutland City Police Department. It works for us. Just want to acknowledge the tension between the recommendation of the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission and the Attorney General and the law enforcement voices that we're hearing today. And so the committee is going to have to weigh those things on balance. Um, and just want to acknowledge that there's a little more attention in the recommendations than maybe I expected in this testimony. <laughs> well, if, I could, if I could address that, if you don't mind, I don't think there's tension. I mean, I think we all have a long history here of working together. We're very lucky in the state of Vermont. Um, we wear different uniforms, but we have the same goal. Um, I, I, I have no doubt that it, given a directive, we can, we can hammer it out. We may have different opinions how we get there, but I can guarantee it'll be cordial. <laughs> Other questions for Captain Byrne from the committee? Great. Thank you so much for your testimony and uh, for the work that you do with State Police. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Captain Byrne, thank you for being here. All right, so uh, I want to give the committee um, a quick break here. Uh, so we should start things back up at 2.40, which is